I'm Sandra D. Robinson, and welcome to The Divorce Project. Are you or someone you know going through a divorce or a custody battle? Well, this show offers legal guidance and caring solutions to help you create a healthy family dynamic as you're going through divorce and post-divorce. Soon, you'll meet the host of The Divorce Project, family law attorney, Barry Fisher. Each show, Barry chooses family specialists, and he takes parents and children, and they talk about divorce. They focus on the positive outcomes and the wonderful mindsets that can happen when we all work together. Hello, and welcome to The Divorce Project. My name is Barry Fisher. I'm a family law attorney in Beverly Hills, and I specialize in divorce and custody and all related family law issues. The purpose of this show is to try to educate the public about how to do a healthy divorce. Yes, it's possible. Today, we're going to talk about the attorney's role and how the attorney helps the client when the client's involved in a high, hotly contested divorce. Today I have a wonderful guest, my client Robert Porras is here with us today, and we're going to have a conversation about some of the things that he had to go through because he was dealing with an op uh, opposing party, his ex-wife, that refused to agree to anything. Well, welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you. So, you know, Robert, could you tell us a little bit about your family and start off with that? Okay. I have uh, three kids, eight-year-old my son and I have uh, my da my daughter which is 15 and uh, my 22 year old and m my ex-wife okay and then um, how many real uh, properties or apartments do you own um, when we were together we had um, nine properties okay. total. and uh, they had multiple units in the properties correct okay correct. and they were located in uh, Georgia and California correct correct now was your wife agreeable during the process of this divorce? Was she willing to sit down and and just work out and, and divide everything 50-50? Uh, not at all. Not at all. Okay. How was she? How did you perceive her? Um, she actually, I didn't even know who this person was. It was like, gosh, I was married for 23 years, and when we separated, it was like a totally different person. So it was, it was very... Um, it was hard. It was very, very hard. So uh, would you say that there was a complete like, lack of trust between the two of you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, you were left with the management of the properties. Correct. And you were doing that during the marriage. Right. And so you continued to do that after the date of separation. Yes. And uh, your wife was objecting to that. Why was she objecting to it? Um, first of all, she's never managed the property. She never really even knew anything about the property. She, some of them she's never even seen. Mm -hmm. But um, what happened was when we got separated, I was managing like I've always have. And uh, the problem was is in real estate, you have a lot of different type of problems that happen. You have water problems. You have tenants that move out. They destroy the place totally different, you know, cars that need to be removed, cleanups, stuff like that, that costs money. So just with the rent, and you, now you have one vacancy, and now you have all these repairs to do, well, you have to use some of that money from the other vacancies, from the other units, to cover those units. So it's it gets very complicated. So basically, uh, the market changed also in real estate during your divorce. The yes. property values went down. And so your properties, most of your properties were in a negative. Yes. So each month you had to cover a negative amount. Exactly. And if you didn't have the amount of money coming in from one unit, you took it from another one. Exactly. And your wife was objecting to that. Exactly. Okay. Now, there was a court order in your case that ordered you to um, pay for the uh, family residence. Yes. And to give support. Right. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, do you think that was financially fair? Uh, not at all. Not at all. It was very difficult. I had all these properties to manage. I had the family home to manage. And there was just not enough money. My wife's income was taken out of, out of the picture. 
and it was just me with all these properties to handle. Mm -hmm. It became very difficult. And, you know, the role of an attorney in coming into a situation, because I wasn't your original attorney, I was your second attorney, I think. Well, whatever. But the when I came into the case, the situation was that we had to correct that. We had to take it from you paying the residents and paying support and to correcting the problem. So what we did as lawyers is we came in and we suggested that there be a neutral management company and that that management company take over the management of the properties and both parties would either receive income from it or pay for the loss. Exactly. Now, has that worked out? Um, no, not really. What happened was now we have another cost. Now we have to pay someone else to manage. I was doing it for free. Now we have to pay another cost. But it did take the burden off of oh, you. Oh, yes. It was worth it was worth it. Okay, so that it was, was worth it. That was yes. a good relief. Yes. And also, you know, we were having a problem because you and your ex wife could never agree on anything. Exactly. And the lawyers couldn't agree. Right. Okay. So what we came up with was uh, the use of a special master. A special master is a judicial officer, usually a retired judge who the court appoints to carry on some function in the divorce. In this case, he was directed and ordered to take all the properties, put them up for sale, market them, sell them, and then take the money and put it in the attorney-client trust. And um, we have Judge Axel that was doing that function. And how things worked out with that? That was excellent. I think that got us way ahead because I didn't think we were going to go anywhere. I was thinking this thing is never going to end because we couldn't even sell a property. We couldn't, we couldn't negotiate anything. When he came in, it was totally different. It was, he took control. Yeah, and because the two parties couldn't agree, the court ordered Judge Axel to decide um, what should be the selling price, uh, try to get the highest price, and then he's allowed to accept the offers and actually open the escrow and sell the property. Exactly. And then the parties were ordered to cooperate with him, and that hasn't been a problem. No, not at all. Now, um, going down the road, uh, there were some properties like the, for instance, the residence. Um, you had the right, or your wife had the right, to buy one of the properties. So that was built into it. Mm -hmm. So wh what's, what's interesting about the case is that the lawyers were able to sculpt out and fashion a solution that worked for the two parties so that the wife was allowed to buy the residence as long as she met some requirements and you were, you were allowed to buy one of the properties and that was much better than having to go through a trial because this was just negotiated in court we wrote up a stipulation everybody signed it the special master was appointed, and then there was more ground rules about what was going to happen. So there was less uncertainty, and it lowered the cost for the parties in terms of attorney's fees. Yes. So what advice would you have for the public about how you can do this better? I would think you should actually try to negotiate with your ex or with the attorneys um, and just meet halfway, really. I think that Put your your feelings aside and just treat it as business and go straight down because when you put your emotions into it, you don't get anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were always willing to divide everything 50-50. Yes. That wasn't an issue no, for you? No, not at all. Not at all. And, you know, now that uh, things have calmed down a little bit, um, how, how about the custody issue, the family uh, issue? How did that work out in your case? It took... It took a while to set the rules, but overall, it's. I didn't see my kids for like three months, so I had to like rekindle. I went to counseling with them, which was excellent. I, I highly recommend that to anybody going through a divorce to be, if they have children, to go into counseling because it's hard on the kids. Mm -hmm. Why weren't? Why didn't you see your kids for three months? Um, my wife was telling me that. I could not see them, so I was trying to see them, but I had no connection. They wouldn't answer phone calls, nothing, so I was pretty much... That, that often happens in a divorce where one parent uh, uses the children 
uh, to as pawns to get an advantage over the other parent. But it's very bad for the kids because the kids should have continuous and frequent relationship with both parents. Yes. And now, has that been restored? Um, off and on. We still have issues, but it's getting better. It's getting better. So everybody in your family is adjusting to the separation and living in two different homes. Exactly, yes. Do the children ever complain to you about living in two separate homes? Um, not really, because when I'm with my kids, it's pretty much... I don't. I only see them twenty percent of the time. So when I see them, it's it's our time. I'm not speaking about what's going on at their home or any of that kind of stuff. I'm more interested and in, focused on them. Before you and your wife separated, you saw your children every day. Yes. And then now that you're separated, is it about two years that you're separated? Yes. How does it feel that you went from seeing your children every day to now only seeing them twenty percent of the time? It's very hard. It's a, it's a hard adjustment, but um, I text them every day, every other day. I try to keep communication going with them, how it was school, just pretty much trying to be in their lives as much as I can. And uh, you always keep your commitment when you're going to see them? Yes. That's yes. very, very important. Yes. You know, I think uh, I've only missed in two years one time, and I was sick. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's very important because when the children have an appointment with you, and then you don't show up, it's, it's devastating exactly. to them. They feel really, really bad about it. Exactly. Well, it sounds like uh, your family's doing better. Yes. And now we still have some more things to do in your case. Yes. We're not finished. No. Okay, so let's talk about what's left, okay? So now, after the properties are all sold, we have to figure out, and if your wife buys the residence, and if you buy another property, we have to balance the, uh, the table. So how much did your wife get and how much did you get? And so what we do is we take the value of the asset that your wife gets. Let's say she gets the residence. I don't know if she will or not, but let's say she gets it. And there's equity in the residence. Let's say just arbitrarily $100,000. And then you didn't get any property. So she has to pay you an equalization payment for 50% the value of that 100000 if she wants to keep the house. So she has to give you, over to your column comes 50000 So some other properties were sold, so, and there's equity, there's money in the bank for that. So you would get 50000 more, and she would get the house. And so we're going to go through all the properties. We're going to make two columns. We're going to add the pluses and minuses. And then we're going to come out at the bottom, and we're going to see the difference. The difference between the two columns is called an equalization payment. And so one of you is going to owe the other some money. Now, there is, there is either going to be cash in the bank to pay it, or there's going to be equity in your respective properties that's going to balance it out. So that's the next phase of your divorce. And hopefully it's just an accounting function. Yes, I hope not, so. Not a legal battle function. Right. Now, after that, there's another thing that's going to happen, and that is both sides are going to claim the other side caused attorney's fees to be incurred. And there's going to be applications, and the court's going to have to decide if we can't agree. I mean, the, the most sane thing to do would say each side pays their own attorney's fees. Right. But that doesn't always happen, so there might be a hearing about that. And then attorney's fees are awarded by the court. Who has the greater ability to pay and who has the greater need? So the court will look at the respective incomes, and then the court will look at the asset division. Well, the asset division is going to be 50-50 in this case. So, and then they're going to look at these 12 factors that they look at under Family Code Section 4320, which deals with age, health, education, was there domestic violence, did one of the... Uh, husband or wife stay home and support the other one going through school? What's the tax consequence? What are the assets of the parties? What is the cash available? And the court goes through that analysis and comes down to the end and makes a ruling about if one party should contribute to the other party's attorney's fees. So you have something to look forward in that. That's still 
and play. Okay. Okay. Um, now, do you have any advice for parents uh, going through a divorce and how to uh, communicate with your children about that you're going to be going through a divorce? Um, I, what I feel is you should spend a lot more time with them because they need that. When, when I moved out, example, when I moved out, I had no contact with them. And then to try to rebuild that, it was the hardest thing. They were like nervous. They would get in the car. They didn't want to say anything. They, they were just totally like, I was just like, are these my children? And it took time. And now, you know, they run to the car. My, my youngest mm -hmm. looks forward to it. And just be there for your kids because it's very difficult for them. Now, how did your children find out that uh, you were going to go through a uh, divorce? Do you remember? Um, did you tell them or did your wife tell them? I think my wife, my wife did tell them. Okay. Yeah. And did they come to you and say why and what's going on? Uh, you know, I had no contact with them. So it's pretty much my wife had control of the whole situation with reference to the children. Mm -hmm. so. You know, the best thing to do, what the courts recommend and what the psychologists recommend is that both parents sit down with the family and say, you know, we made this decision, we've been, you, how long were you married for? 23 years. 23 years, it's a long marriage, that um, married for 23 years and we decided that we've grown apart but we're still going to preserve the family, we're still going to be there for you, we're going to be there for school and events and all the important things in your lives, but you do it together with your spouse because that sends a message to the kids, okay, there's a change here, but maybe it's not so bad right. if both my parents are going to work with each other. But it's very difficult to do because the parents are so angry, feel rejected, feel betrayed. There's all these emotions going on, so it's very difficult very to do. Very difficult. But that is an important thing to do. Actually, I'm, in consideration of your case, there was one more thing that's going to come up in your case, and that is spousal support and child support. And uh, that's kind of interesting because child support is based on your respective incomes. And so there's a computer software program that called Guideline Support that the, diso the DISO master that's used in Los Angeles. And you just plug the numbers in, who pays the health insurance, if there's a mortgage, tax consequences, and it actually generates a number. And depending on the timeshare, you know, if you have 20% with your children, if you increase it to 50%, your child support goes down because they want to encourage the parents to be with the children. So if you're spending less time, that means the other parent needs more help financially, so the child support goes up. So it's a function of that. And you're paying child support now, am I correct? Uh, in lieu, we paying the, I was paying the family home. Okay, so that sometimes we do that where you pay the family residence instead of child support. Now, spousal support, is a different issue because the purpose of permanent spouse, there's two spousal supports. There's one which is temporary spousal support which occurs during the marriage, during the uh, divorce, and that is to keep the status quo. And because people are going through a transition and that's why the court ordered you to pay for the family residence because that kept the status quo of your wife and your kids situation that their life didn't get disrupted. Exactly. Instead of paying a dollar amount. Right. Because actually in your case, spousal support and child support would have been less than the cost of paying for the residence. Exactly. So you actually got ordered to pay more, but the purpose and the policy behind it was to keep the status quo. Now at the end of the case, we have a thing called permanent spousal support. Now that's based on how long will it take the other spouse, and by the way, California doesn't call them husband and wife, we call them spouses, because we're blind to gender. So if the wife is making more money than the husband, the wife is ordered to pay spousal support to the husband. It's not always because the husband is a husband that he pays more spousal support to the wife. 
And then they go through those same 12 factors that they look at in attorney's fees. You know, age, sex, education, domestic violence, those, those 12 factors I mentioned earlier. And then they look at the income of each, of each parent. And then sometimes, not in this case, one parent stopped working, and then we talk about imputing income, where we would say that person has an ability to work. So they shouldn't get away without having something calculated on their side, mm -hmm. so they would impute income. But in your case, both of you are working. Correct. So the court will look at that and see what it takes, and how long does the other spouse need to bring themselves back to self-supporting, independent. Now, what does your wife do? Uh, she's a probation officer. Okay, and what do you do? I, I am a representative. I go out um, to see clients that attorneys uh, want me to see to take in, intake information. Okay, so you're both employed and you're both making uh, fairly steady salaries. So, um, and your incomes are about the same? Um, mine totally flex fluctuates because it depends on the attorneys, if they call me, if they don't call me. Uh -huh. So, uh, but they're pretty much almost the same. Okay. So that part of it balances out. Your assets are about equal. So um, the court may or may not award any spousal support ordering you to pay your soon-to-be ex-wife. Uh, it depends on the other factors that they, they look at, but it sounds like you're almost equal. Yes. So, yeah. And uh, you're sharing the custody and you're paying already child support. Yes. So um, how has the experience been with the uh, special master? That actually was very, in the beginning I was like, oh gosh, everything is going to be in somebody's hands, control, you know, they're going to do whatever they want to do, but the judge was very fair. Um, he got us good, some of the properties actually that I thought were less value, he got more for. So that was, that was really good. And um, just, we had that communication and he would text me, email us like, this is what's happening. Great news. I got the, you know, he kept me informed. And I think that's where, what we're missing. It was it was pretty much we couldn't agree on anything we would leave court and that would be it so it, it wouldn't move forward till the next court and we couldn't agree on it and then we were getting nowhere so when the master came in he took control of everything and he you know he says little jokes on his emails and stuff it just makes it that much easier yeah he he did uh, judge axel did a great job in your case yes and, and yes. what was interesting for me to observe because the communications would come to me and I would forward them to you because he had needed to communicate with the attorneys. Um, I noticed that he jumped into it so quickly and he got a result like so quickly. Like right. he, he sold properties within, it seemed like within weeks he had properties sold. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was great. And I didn't have to deal with any of the paperwork. It right. was wonderful. Not only <laughs> you didn't have to deal with the paperwork, but he selected the broker. He negotiated the price. He accepted the offer. Right. He opened the escrow. He closed the escrow, and everything went smooth. Smooth. Yeah, he it did. Was, he did was, a great job. That was yes. a great solution for your case. Yes. So sometimes in high conflict divorces, it's good to bring in an independent third party to manage the assets or or liquidate the assets. And in this case, it it, it just worked wonderful. Right. Right. Now, in terms of uh, selecting a lawyer, uh, do you have any advice to uh, the public about, you know, what to look for? Because now you've been involved in this for two years, and it, it's been a bumpy road for you. It hasn't been completely smooth. Right. It's, it's getting good now. Yes. But, so can you give any advice to the audience about what to look for in an attorney? When I was looking for an attorney, um, I wanted somebody, not a big firm, I was looking for somebody just that would look at my case and understand my case because I knew my case had a bunch of issues and I knew that my ex-wife was going to give me the, a very hard time. So I was looking for somebody that was going to really put the time and effort into my case. And that's what I found. Mm, thank you. Thank you. 
You know, I've enjoyed uh, working on your case and working with you. You're a good client because when I send you an email, I get a response right away. Yes. And you always come through with the documents that are needed. And that's something else that you should be aware of, that when you go through the divorce, you should help your attorney. Because the more information that you give to your attorney, the easier the attorney's job. So when the attorney sends you a letter or an email and says, this is what I need, get to work on it right away, put it together, and send it to the attorney. Because the attorney can't move forward without that information. Exactly. And you've done that very well, by the way. Thank you. you know? Thank you. Um, you know, it's funny, on the other side, uh, you know, in, in California divorces, there's supposed to be voluntary disclosure. That means that both sides are supposed to voluntarily exchange financial documents. But oftentimes that doesn't happen and we have to do discovery. So you, you complied with discovery in the process? Yes. It wasn't easy, right? No. I, when I left the home, I took my clothes. I didn't take any paperwork. So I had to literally hours on the phone and just recreate, docu you know, get documents here, get documents there. It was tough. Yeah. It was tough. Yeah, but you did a great job. And thank I'm you. glad it's coming near the end. Yes. And, you know, I want to thank you for being on our show. It was a pleasure to have you. And I want to tell the public that please come back next week, see us again. And I want to acknowledge Romeo Carey, the director of KBEV Studios at Beverly Hills High School. This program is completely produced and directed and edited by Beverly Hills High School students. They do an incredible job for us. We always feel welcome here. And if you have any comments at the end of the show, there's an email address. You could send it in. And if you ever need a free consultation, just give me a call. I'm happy to respond to you. Thanks for watching. See you next time. We thank you for tuning in, and we invite you, our viewing audience, to participate in next week's conversation. On The Divorce Project, our goal is to help bring you the healthy outcome that your family deserves. So please email your questions to team at thedivorceproject.com or call us directly at the number on your screen.